Hello everyone. In my last video, I solved about five AWS Solutions Architect Associate Exam sample questions. And in this video, I will be solving five more sample questions for the Associate Solutions Architect Exam. So let's get started. And I'm gonna be resuming from question number six because I left off after question number five in the first part. So let's see what question number six says. A web application allows customers to upload orders to an S3 bucket. The resulting S3 events trigger a Lambda function that inserts a message to an SQS queue. A single EC2 instance reads message from the queue, processes them, and stores them in a DynamoDB table partitioned by unique order ID. Next month, traffic is expected to increase by a factor of 10, and a solutions architect is reviewing the architecture for possible scaling problems. Which component is most likely to need re-architecting to be able to scale to accommodate the new traffic? Out of all the services mentioned in the question, including the Lambda function, SQSQ, EC2 instance, DynamoDB table, and Amazon S3, only EC2 instance is such a service that is not managed by AWS, right? You provision an EC2 instance, and you are responsible to increase the size of the EC2 instance, the size of the EBS volumes, and so on. Lambda function scales to the demand because it is serverless and driven by events, right? It's event driven. So the more events there are, more Lambda function are called. SQS queues are managed queues provided by AWS and DynamoDB table, all you have to click is a checkbox that will auto scale the table up and down. Um, so out of the four options, EC2 instance is the only one that is not managed by AWS, that's why this is the component most likely to need re-architecting to be able to scale to accommodate the new traffic. And as mentioned in the um, answer below, you know, it's better to put that EC2 instance in an auto-scaling group, right, across um, two AZs, or at least put the EC2 instance in an auto-scaling group. So what happens is you might have an EC2 instance that is doing all the work, right? You can start with one or at least two EC2 instance, right? You can start with two for uh, high availability, right? If something goes wrong, then you can uh, still have the other one working and then you can put them in an auto scaling group. So they increase and decrease as the demand increases and decreases. So if you put them in an auto scaling group, there might be one more EC2 instance added to the auto scaling group and one more when the demand is uh, increased. And as the demand decreases, you can set up the auto scaling group to remove the EC2 instances automatically so that uh, you don't pay for those resources when not needed. So that's what question number six is asking and this should be fairly straightforward. Um, Let's move on to question number seven. An application saves the logs to an S3 bucket. A user wants to keep the logs for one month for troubleshooting purposes and then purge the logs. What feature will enable this? Now, to be able to successfully answer the question, you need to know what the meaning of purge is, right? Now, if you know the meaning, that's okay, but if not, let's look at the meaning, what purge means. Purge means removal or ejection or eradication, right? Purge means to remove something. So let's go back to the question and now we know what this means. What feature will enable me to purge the logs after one month, right? Option A says adding a bucket policy on the S3 bucket. Now that's not right because a bucket policy will uh, do things like uh, control access to certain users 
or stores an account, but you know it does not let you delete stuff uh, after 30 days or 10 days or whatever time you want. Um, option B, configuring lifecycle configuration rules on S3 bucket. That looks like the right one. Uh, option C, creating an IAM policy for that S3 bucket. Now, IAM policy is also uh, used to control access um, and permissions on the bucket. So that's not the right answer. And option D says enabling course on S3 bucket. And course is set up so that other uh, website from external origin can access the bucket. That is not the option that will let you enable deleting um, logs automatically after one month. So configuring lifecycle rules on an S3 bucket lets you uh, do what the question is asking and that is to delete the logs automatically after one month. Now let's take a look at how we can do that really quick. I'm going to go to uh, an S3 bucket which is right now empty but if you go to management and there is something called life cycle and if I add a life cycle rule then I can say delete after 30 days right so that it's a bit descriptive next and I can say delete the current version and I can say current version is expired after 30 days right so expiration means deletion and I can say after 30 days the current version of the object is deleted right something like this okay and anything that I put in this bucket will be deleted after 30 days. So that's how you set up uh, this. And as we know now, uh, this will be enabled by configuring lifecycle configuration rules on S3 bucket. So this is the, the right answer. Okay, so let's move on to question number eight. An application running on EC2 instances processes sensitive information stored on Amazon S3 the information is accessed over the internet. The security team is concerned that the internet connectivity to S3 is a security risk. Which solution will resolve the security concern? Now, the first option says access the data through an internet gateway, right? Um, the whole uh, problem that we have right now is that we don't want, you know, internet access, right? We don't want that internet uh, connectivity. So option A cannot be the right answer. Um, option B is not right because you cannot use VPN to connect to Amazon S3. Uh, option C says access the data through a NAT gateway. A NAT gateway is a device that uh, lets you browse uh, the internet from a private subnet, right? So it does not solve our problem because uh, you still have to go out through the internet uh, to talk to Amazon S3. Now, um, option D says access the data through a VPC endpoint for Amazon S3. Uh, now, this looks like the right answer, and this is the right answer. And, and you know, to be able to answer this uh, correctly, you need to know what a VPC endpoint is. Uh, so, VPC endpoint. So, a VPC endpoint is such a service that lets you connect to uh, services like S3, right? without going through the internet and you can just set up a VPC endpoint connection and you can just talk you know from EC2 to S3 without using the internet so um, that is the, something that you can set up if you go to your VPC dashboard on the left navigation pane there is uh, something called endpoints if you click on the endpoints option then you can create an endpoint uh, from a certain VPC and you can choose a certain Amazon uh, service so that uh, it can be something like Amazon S3, right? So you can set up a endpoint to Amazon S3 uh, for a certain VPC. So this is how you create a VPC endpoint uh, and you can explore how to do this, but now you know this is the right answer. And basically, a VPC endpoint allows you to securely connect your VPC to another service. 
and you don't need internet for this to work uh, or you don't need the internet gateway for this to work so this is the right answer option d let's move on to question number nine so question number nine says an organization is building an amazon redshift cluster in their shared services vpc the cluster will host sensitive data how can the organization control which networks can access the cluster look at the phrase properly how can the organization control which networks can access the cluster what the question is asking is you know right here which networks can access the cluster so how can you control that option a says run the cluster in a different vpc and connect through vpc peering uh, this option does not tell me anything about controlling access it just tells me that you know peer a, in a different vpc but what what about the access to the cluster nothing is given uh, about access to the cluster so i want to move on and see if b says something more create a database user inside the amazon redshift cluster only for the users on the network so you know you cannot control which network will access the cluster by creating a user so i don't think this is the right answer let's move on to option c uh, define a cluster security group for the cluster that allows access from the allowed networks now this seems to be you know a proper way to control access because it tells me that you know define a security group for the cluster that will allow access only from certain networks now this you know is the best answer so far because this is the only way where access can be controlled and you know i can say that allow access only from this ip or this network uh, in a security group so this is one of my security groups and right here i can edit the security group and say you know let someone come to this instance right so let all the traffic come to this instance but only from a certain network right 10.0.0.0/16 slash or something so this way i can control traffic you know so this is uh, the right answer because the question is asking how can you control which networks can access the cluster so option c is the right answer question number 10 a solutions architect is designing an online shopping application running in a VPC on EC2 instances behind an ELB application load balancer. The instances run in an auto scaling group across multiple availability zones. The application tier must read and write data to a customer managed database cluster. There should be no access to the database from the internet, but the cluster must be able to obtain software patches from the internet which vpc design meets these requirements option a says public subnets for both the application tier and the database cluster now the question says there should be no access to the database from the internet right but then option a says put the database in the public subnet so that means that you know there will be access from the internet so option a is not the right answer option b says public subnets for the application tier and private subnets for the database cluster um, let's look at the other options and see if there's a, a better option out there now option c says public subnets for the application tier and nat gateway and private subnets for the database cluster so to visualize that you can look at something like this okay so something like this right for the nat gateway and application uh, cluster you put them in a public subnet and the database will be in a private subnet and this looks like the right answer because the requirement in the question is the database cluster must be able to obtain software patches from the internet so one way to do that is by using a nat gateway what you can do is you can go through the NAT gateway that's in a public subnet 
which has a route to the internet and you can download uh, the patch that way so this is one of the solutions and the option fulfills uh, our requirement now option D is something that you have to watch out for because the way it's written you know might confuse you according to this you know, the the NAT gateway in option D will be in the private subnet and the NAT gateway will not have a route to the internet and this means that the database cannot connect to the internet so option D is not the right answer now we've solved 10 sample questions for the AWS solutions architect uh, exam and if you have any questions uh, on anything on, uh, that we talked in this video or any questions about AWS in general or any questions any sample questions that you think uh, is confusing you post them in the comment section below and we can solve them together uh, please provide any feedbacks in the comment section as well I would like to know if something is working, if the way I explain is working or not, and I would really like to help you pass the AWS associate exams. If you're taking the exam, good luck. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.